of its 27 Germany Foundation. USD was founded in 1611 by the third Archbishop of Molina, Monsignor Miguel de Benfides. On the 13th, May or Dendipicadores, together with Fathers Benito de Nieva, Bernardo de Santa Catalina. Initially, it was called Culeo de Nuestro Senora de Santísimo Rosario, and later renamed Culeo de Santo Tomas in memory of the main and preeminent Dominican theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas. Through its 400 years of being the oldest existing university in Asia, UST has produced heroes, martyrs, and other very great Filipinos who carved the destiny and fortune of the Filipino nation. Pompey, the University of Santo Tomas, a pontifical university, on September 17, 1902, and in 1947, Pope Pius XII bestowed upon it the title of the Catholic University of the Philippines. In 1624, the Colegio was authorized to confer academic degrees in theology, philosophy, and arts. 21 years later, on November 20, 1645, the college was elevated to the rank of a university by the order of Pope Innocent X. In 1680, it was subsequently placed under the patronage of the Spanish crown. It was King Charles III of Spain who granted UST the title of Royal University in 1785. After having said this, after having smelled all these historical remembrances placed, as it were, in a sacred patina, and after having traversed this romantic brief history, redolent of lyrical romance, of the University of Santo Tomas across a quadricentennial span of 400 years in the life of UST, which in terms of its student population is certainly the biggest and largest Catholic university in the world. What great challenge now confronts UST, a challenge that is extremely significant as far as the place of UST is concerned in the international commerce of knowledge. I think the crucial and vital challenge is that put forward by interfaith and intercultural dialogue, so very uh, in trend in Philippine discussions. Interfaith dialogue, of course, to quote an authority, refers to cooperative and positive interaction between people of different religious traditions and spiritual and humanistic beliefs at both the individual and institutional level with the aim of deriving a common ground in belief through a concentration on similarities between faiths, understanding of values, and commitment to the world. Dialogue often connotes promoting understanding between and amongst different religions to increase acceptance to others instead of synthesizing or combining or amalgamating new beliefs. The view that the history of religion is a history of conflict pertains more to the state of affairs rather than to the state of the dialogue. At the global, particularly Asian level, the interfaith dialogue presents a great challenge for the peaceful coexistence of different values and cultures. All the great religions of the world have a common perspective in respecting human dignity on what is right and wrong and what is equitable and just. I call attention to the religious summit organized by the United Nations, which was the first time that the spiritual and religious leaders of the world gathered to construct a partnership of peace and concord with the United Nations and specify ways that the global religious communities can cooperate in undertaking peace and eradicating poverty. A culture of peace and nonviolence must be cultivated on the basis of tolerance, patience, understanding, broad-mindedness, acceptance, and social inclusiveness. In order that this noble objective can be accomplished, a whole range of measures can be suggested. One, 
promote, strengthen, and respect the freedom of religion and beliefs in ways that will stimulate and support interfaith dialogue. Two, seek the assistance of religious and spiritual leaders of standing and prestige in resolving intercommunal conflicts and disputes when and where applicable. Three, encourages up, feeding, and correct the development and incorporation of interfaith studies for peace and development in the school curricula, such as the program of subjects that are studied and prescribed by the University of Santo Tomas. Support and advance media program and initiatives that encourage better understanding of other cultures and religions. And lastly, is strongly implement all the resolutions of the United Nations with respect to all the General Assembly declarations and programs of action on human rights and cultural diversity. Our Philippine foreign policy and international relations are profoundly committed to fight intolerance, religious discrimination, and to strengthen mutual respect and understanding by means of intercultural and interfaith dialogue. I was honored and privileged to be the delegate plenipotentiary by the Republic in the special non-aligned movement ministerial meeting on interfaith dialogue and cooperation for peace and development held March 16, 17, and 18, 2010 at the Philippine International Center. This was the largest meeting comprising 118 member states, 15 observer countries, and eight observer organizations. The Philippines was accepted as now non-aligned movement ministerial meeting uh, at the 10th NAM summit in Jakarta, despite prior exclusion due to our special relationship with the U.S. The Philippines has always recognized the validity of NAM's principles and objectives. In NAM that met in Manila March 16 to 18, 2010, last year, was conscious and aware that a culture of peace can be attained through dialogue, the promotion of inclusion, social integration, equality, justice, enhancement of mutual understanding and respect the advancement of knowledge and appreciation of the richness and wisdom found in all civilizations, the promotion of common ground among civilizations and religions in order to address common challenges, threatening shared values, universal human rights, and achievements of human society in various fields, and also the enhancement of respect for cultural diversity and cultural heritage. The non-aligned movement on interfaith dialogue is stressed the necessity of respecting cultural diversity and maximizing its benefits through working together to build a harmonious promotes dialogue among civilizations and helps create an environment conducive to the promotion of a culture of peace, human rights, and human dignity. Similarly, NAM was also cognizant of the contributions of migration and increased people-to-people -people contracts, such as, for example, our overseas Filipino contract workers, numbering over 8 million abroad. It asserted the positive contributions of migration in increasing understanding and fostering tolerance and cooperation among cultures and religions and reaffirmed the responsibility of governments to safeguard and protect the rights of all migrants against illegal acts of incitement to ethnic, racial, and religious discrimination, hostility, or violence, and crimes perpetrated with racist or xenophobic motivation by individual or groups. In the field of international politics, international organizations, and comparative foreign policy, there is a crucial need to build interfaith dialogue and intercultural conversation. There is the need for partnership at the national and regional levels in support of conflict prevention, peace building efforts, nuclear disarmament, and the overarching goals of peace and development. We are all happy and elated over the fruitful efforts and initiatives taken by the Arab Republic of Egypt, the Republic of Indonesia, 
the Kingdom of Morocco, the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, the Islamic Republic of Iran, the State of Qatar, the Republic of Senegal, the Kingdom of Bahrain, and our own Republic of the Philippines in exploring the opportunities for coexistence and cooperation among religions, cultures, and civilizations through holding conferences and fora in order to identify and develop strategies and programs at the national, regional, and international levels. What role or important part do universities and colleges play in interfaith dialogues? Veritably and very, very much, intentional involvement is mainly limited to the area of participation in the international knowledge system. However, the very importance of the university, such as UST, in both the national and international settings entails or imposes that the university will, it cannot be prevented from happening, become involved institutionally in the international interfaith and intercultural dialogues. Please remember that the university participates in the international knowledge system. Interfaith dialogue is part of the international knowledge system. Just as it participates in its local knowledge system through its functions of teaching, research, and services. And the university also acts through the role model of educational institutions which it provides. The international knowledge system is the universe of institutions and agencies which produce, disseminate, and use knowledge self-consciously and view their roles as being defined at least in part by this participation in the system of similar units. My assessment evaluation is that the university, as a teaching institution, participates in the international knowledge system, which includes the study on interfaith dialogue and cooperation for peace and development through the students it accepts, through the curriculum it offers, and through the faculty it hires. Within its own national system, the admissions policy of the university towards its own nationals in part determines which of its own nationals will receive enough post-secondary education to actually participate in the international knowledge system. The university's acceptance, such as the UST's acceptance of its students overseas, foreign and across the seas, particularly those from the Tercer Mundo or the Third World who go to post-industrial countries determines to some measure and degree the intimacy of the particular institution with the international knowledge system. In the United States of America and in Great Britain alone, two systems with which I am most acquainted and conversant the statistics concerning the scale of foreign student admission to American and British institutions of learning <coughs> are staggering, not to say astonishing and amazing. In the research, the interrelationship inter of the universities with the international knowledge system is almost complete in most disciplines, the agenda for research, what is considered to be a legitimate problem and what is thought to be an appropriate, correct method of inquiry or investigation is determined by the norms of disciplinary communities which know no national boundaries and frontiers, but which are clearly dominated by a small number of universities, mainly in the post-industrial countries. However, I must note and comment that this pattern of domination is not imposed without constraint by the international knowledge community itself. In other words, a professor at Harvard University or at Oxford University could not impose a revolutionary paradigm on interfaith dialogue without the agreement of the international community of scholars and savants. But there is no doubt that new paradigm 
coming from professors and scholars in Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge or Yale or the London School of Economics and Political Science or UCLA or University of Glasgow or Stanford University or Massachusetts Institute of Technology or the Universidad Azul Berlin would attract more serious and solemn attention than a professor working in a small college in Ghana or a small university in southern Nigeria or a school in Zimbabwe. Studies and analysis of the relationship between post-industrial and third world countries support the international knowledge system and the pattern of knowledge and the pattern of domination that exists in the system. The final and perhaps the most important mode of university involvement in the international knowledge system, which I insist includes the interfaith dialogue and cooperation for peace and development, has been the very model of knowledge generation and dissemination which it provides across national boundaries and frontiers. Historically, the experiences of one national university system has influenced another. The impact of British and then German universities of the United States stands as relevant example as has been at the connection between the American land grant model and the emergence of similar institutions such as the University of the Philippines in my country. As an institution that formed the university, including UST, that has embraced 400 years up to our time in 2011, changes itself as a result of its entwinement or interweaving with the international knowledge system. A range of important questions emerges from these observations and commentaries about the transnational or supranational or macro-global role of universities in the 21st century concerning the international knowledge system, especially as it touches upon interfaith dialogue and inter-civilizational conversation. A system question deserves further elaboration. What? What is the present character of the international knowledge system in terms of its in the institutional composition and the dynamics and zealousness of exchange with it? Two, how does the university's role, such as UST's role, presently compare with its past relationship to the other participants in the system? Three, and finally, how may we expect the mode of university participation in the system change as the system itself continues to evolve and unfold in the 21st century, this era which we can call, we, which we can call the age of cybernetics and automatic control system in both machines and living things. In my previous review analysis, of the features and distinguishing characteristics of the international knowledge system is correct. The implications for the supranational or transnational or international universities of universities are significant. Regardless of institutional choice, universities are intimate and close participants in the international knowledge system, which sometimes limits and sometimes increases institutional autonomy, but always affect and is affected by the university's policies and actions. Therefore, as supranational or transnational units, universities such as UST, after 400 years and 400 more years thereafter, must assess and critique their value positions both nationally and internationally insofar as they wish to justify the impact they have on the system or take steps to temper or to moderate the effect of the system on them. There is not the smallest amount of doubt in my mind that universities such as UST after 400 years are inextricably tied to the central debates of the contemporary international order such as debates and discussions in interfaith dialogue. As we commemorate the RUST on the occasion of its 400 years, 
I find we are in a world so extremely rich in culture, civilization, and traditions. We know that diversity in culture could only advance and put forward our civilization unless it is uncomprehended and misunderstood. As a professor of Dr. Jose Rizal and in international politics and foreign policy in UST for the past 37 years, and therefore my university teaching comprise more than 9.25% of USD's 400 years. And after actively and energetically delivering lectures, addresses, symposiums, congresses, seminars, colloquia, conferences, forums, roundtable talks, and other forms of academic discussions, USD for me was and is a place of purest light, a shelter of thought and ideas, an academic grove of truth, beauty, and goodness. I feel truly humbled and exalted, genuinely delighted and honored to be a teacher academician in UST for 37 years, helping and assisting my adopted alma mater, for I did not graduate from UST but from UP, to welcome to its groves of academe every ray of genius and brilliance of intellect. I am witnessing La Universidad de Santo Tomas after 400 years richly deserving and suffering its description, its narrative and its chronicle as Christiani sapiensi emicantesimo, or most resplendent light of Christian wisdom, which Pope John Paul described us when he visited us twice in UST. May God sustain UST with his constant and unceasing guidance. In Jesus' name, my Lord and my Savior, I pray. I have always maintained that UST was and is an instrument of the Filipino nation. At times it was and is an agent of intellectual evolution. At other more memorable, remarkable, and historic times, it was and is an agent of intellectual revolution. As its celebrated mission proclaims, the University of Santo Tomas, the pontifical and Catholic University of the Philippines, inspired by the ideals of St. Dominic de Guzman and guided by the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas, dedicates herself to the pursuit of truth through the production, advancement, and transmission of knowledge for the formation of competent and compassionate professionals committed to the service of the church, the nation, and the global community. And as its vision envisages, faithful to her centuries-old tradition of excellence, the University of Santo Tomas envisions herself as a globally recognized institution of higher learning, actualizing the professional and moral formation of our students and effecting social transformation. God grant that UST, this magnifico centro de enseñanza, continue to be the staunch and conscious trustee of the patrimony of our historic past the solid and positive nationalistic groundwork of the present and the watchful harbinger of the gift and bounty of the future. The Asia-Pacific region now is the world's center of gravity. And how truly urgent and pressing to the welfare of the Filipino nation and the world, therefore, is the complete accomplishment of the purposes and vision set forth by UST. I entreat that Jesus Christ be with UST, especially in this auspicious time of its quadricentennial anniversary, and that its faculty administration is students alumni Dominican fathers, guardians, and friends be filled with a due sense of the obligations and responsibilities by, assumed by all of us. I, for one, as a simple teacher academician of USD for the seven year, 37, and therefore my teaching years comprise 9.25% of USD's total 400 years, and pledged to give 
my fullest amount of his strength, devotion and enthusiasm in efforts and work to lead our beloved and venerable USD forward and foremost on the vanguard ground of her lofty and preeminent educational and spiritual objectives and mission as in the title bestowed in 1947 to us by His Holiness Pope Pius XII, the Catholic University of the Philippines, and as the title granted on September 17, 1902 by Pope Leo XIII, the Pontifical University. Thank you for your patience. Okay, I guess um, this is a very interdisciplinary panel on Catholic education in universities. There's an intersection of sorts. I mean, you have teaching, university research, and international relations and intercultural dialogue. So I open the floor now for some questions. Okay, here's one. And any, any more? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, to draw another connection between the two topics, uh, but we have received a number of comments from faculty in the Philippines about the University of St. Thomas, um, raising concerns about the Catholic identity of the institution. Uh, and having no familiarity with the university, I couldn't even begin to comment on those. But I wondered if maybe you could comment a little bit about that. The concerns seem to center around uh, concerns about liberation theology, uh, dominating the theology of the university. And when you talk about interfaith dialogue, Pope Benedict would argue that interfaith dialogue begins with an understanding, appreciation, and fidelity to our own faith entering into that. So, so I'd be very interested to, to know what your thoughts are with regard to that at the University of St. Thomas and perhaps some of the other universities in the building. You know, that, that is a fair statement you make. That is that concern uh, because of the, uh, the nature of the Catholic Sooner or later, it goes to the region what is happening to the Faculty of Arts and Letters or to the Faculty of Philosophy. At the same time, of course, there is the, the favorite argument of the professors of academic freedom. And that has always been not an issue, but a central concern in UST. And therefore, uh, it is a very delicate topic whenever, let us say, uh, a region, especially if it happens to be a Spanish region, or, although there is now a law that positions like region, rector, should be occupied by Filipino members in the uh, Rosary province of the universe of the Orden de Picadores. Many of us are Filipinos, but there you still have these Spanish regions. How can that be helped when they're very proud, rightly so, of UST as the crowning jewel of Spanish colonization? But sooner or later it is discussed, there are faculty meetings, and the liberation theology is exposed for what it is uh, in the debates, and usually in the oral discussion among faculty members, it does not win adherence. There is still uh, the adherence uh, to the mission, vision of UST, and to the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas. I am proud to tell you that last May 23, 24, 25, 26, the University of Santo Paz sponsored an international uh, congeries of scholars from Spain, Latin America, Europe, USA, and even from China and from Thailand, etc. Uh, and, and we met uh, for 23 and 45 to discuss Thomism, the Thomistic philosophy, the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas, and how they can apply to Asia, how they can apply to the Philippines. I, for one, uh, I did not detect the dominance of liberation theology in our discussion. But to be fair, your, your statement uh, is really a fair statement because there are those who would insist on it. But they can insist on that in, this, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the discussion. But generally, among uh, civilized men and women, uh, it dies out. Now, Pope John Paul 
have visited us twice, first and second. And in fact, there are strong rumors that uh, Santo Papa Benedicto XVI may visit us in our closing ceremonies in January. He was supposed to be with us May uh, 2011, but you know, something happened in the Vatican. I mean, uh, something happened, and it is not so easy for His Holiness to travel 13 hours or more, more 15 hours. But at least there is that rumor, it's a rumor from Father Rolando de la Rosa, from Father Fausto Gomez, who used to attend the Society of Catholic, from other uh, Reverend Dominicans, that there might be that possibility. So, uh, as long as it is that way, uh, I think it is much deserved that we will be described as Christiani Sapienci e Macantissimum, as the most resplendent light of Christian wisdom, and uh, no less from several popes. So, but there is that, the, 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 it is a trend, liberalization theology, but one thing was so well discussed, the visit of uh, uh, Pope John Paul in the Middle East, the, the, the dialogue of the Santo Papa Benedicto XVI in this regard, I think, uh, yes, I, I don't believe it will be uh, overwhelmed. But there is that debate, deliberate, especially among our friends whom we invited from South America. Uh, who delivered their own talks and their own interpretation of St. Thomas Aquinas. But it has to be that way, but, but it doesn't gain the upper hand. And if it does, you may be sure the region, it happened to a faculty of mine, to a faculty member, I think in one lecture he said something that was really against the uh, uh, teaching of the church. No, 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 no scandal. No, no, he, he was interviewed by the dean. So that is what you think, uh, that is what, but uh, we did not create UST for that purpose, the mission. And uh, the, the following semester, he just did not come back. Uh, and even in the Ateneo de Manila, Ateneo de Manila, a leading Catholic, University in the Philippines, many of its faculty members signed a resolution favoring the reproductive bill, which is the current debate in the Philippines. And that was quite a news in Philippine media. I think Father James Reuter and another Jesuit wrote a letter in the dailies that those who signed the manifesto that they are in favor of the, of the reproductive bill, uh, they have no business continuing to teach in the Ateneo de Manila. I don't know how they accept that, but I, I think that is the most political thing he could have done without raising really a controversy because it is a country already dominated by Catholics, even only nominally, uh, 85%, and Muslim is, is insignificant, 85%, and the faith is so alive with the Catholic bishops. That is why may I extend an invitation to my eminent colleagues that my email is josedavidlapus.com, josedavidlapus, josedavidlapus, at yahoo.com. If you have literature or essays uh, 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 on the teaching of the church, and I'm sure you do, uh, as far as reproduction, as far as overpopulation, uh, I will be happy to have them because we are determined when I return to the Philippines to lead a role in the debate against the reproduction bill. It is now dominated by eloquent politicians who say, oh, I'm a Catholic, like a senadora from the Philippines, I will soon have a doctoral in theology, but I am a liberal Catholic, I can be in favor of this and be a, a faithful Catholic. That kind of argument, which is really absurd. So, we have to do the millions. Soon we will be 90 millions. And with the South so... Uh, so dominant and so militant 
di 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 Abu Sayyaf, di Mindanao, di Moro Islam Liberation Front, di di Moro etc etc in the south uh, having the upper hand in the military skirmishes because we have a president who say well uh, we will meet this with can you imagine a president when 32 soldiers had been uh, massacred and more policemen were massacred in the south a president saying but we will be for equal justice that makes us very weak in the eyes of the muslim and the islamic I think a stronger uh, phrase could have been done, but then he he, he posse forts, he, he is so uh, he is so uh, wishy washy. But in the long run, Aquino, our president is on this side, being the son of uh, a very sainted president. Uh, it needs to be a sustainable, vibrant presence. Uh, needs to reach some sort of critical mass or maybe a tipping point. Uh, it depends on the department whether that one is, if it's a brand new employee, uh, that employee is never going to make it through the uh, um, tenure process if everybody else in the department is uh, from a different mind and a different worldview. And so there has, has to be the, the type of support that's necessary to keep that individual alive and, and moving. And I, I'm thinking that. At one point in time, I was working for a Methodist University and um, I realized that we had one Catholic in the department, but it was more of a tokenism kind of an approach because the, the mentality of what was going on there was the whole idea that, hey, the world began with Martin Luther and anything that went prior to that didn't exist. And uh, when you cross out that much human history, presentation and effective approach of what Catholic thinking is all about. Okay, um, so anyway, getting back to the questionnaire, uh, I, was, I was curious to, I know you submitted it to all of the uh, members of this organization, what kind of response rate did you get? My question, and the reason I'm asking that is, I attempted to fill it out, mm -hmm. and it was not successful. So I'm not sure, I'm, I'm guessing that you didn't get it really, really good. Yeah, the focus on this is not, President Corazon Aquino and, and, and of Cardinal Sin. I mean, very close to the Cardinal, very close to the Vatican. But may I say your, your comments are really appearing in Philippine media. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to turn back to John and John on uh, this whole issue of uh, assuring that we've got a, a vibrant and sustainable uh, research presence on Catholic universities department by department. Um, and, and your efforts are very important, I think, to uh, come up with a measurement, uh, a metric that's going to work effectively so that we establish a baseline of where Catholic universities are at this point in time. Um, and uh, I, I must reassure you that um, while the effort is great, the one concern that I have is our, the standard that we keep talking about, one per department. Um, it, it, you know, I, 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 I'm troubled by the one per, per, per department. Um, you know, emphasize that simplicity is really important in filling, uh, filling any questionnaire out. Uh, and obviously, if you're going to go to deans, it's got to be very simple. Uh, right. Right. Uh, and uh, it occurs to me that we might be better with more of a global measure. Um, you know, to the extent that you believe you have a sustainable and vibrant Catholic.